So welcome, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, I'm Charles Sims. I'm the director of the Energy and Environment Program here at the Baker Center. Uh, thanks for coming to our fourth Energy and Environment Forum of the semester. Uh, if this is your first time here, welcome. This is our opportunity as faculty and staff and students and members of the general public to come in and talk about an environmental or energy issue from an interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, so this is not your normal seminar where you have one person who's talking at you the whole time. We like to have kind of an open discussion, so when we're talking at the end, don't think of this as uh, Dr. Laird is the expert, because he is, but this is also a chance for you to bring your own disciplinary perspectives to talk about these things uh, and bounce these ideas off of one another, okay? Uh, so if you like what you see today, uh, I would suggest that you follow us on a variety of social media platforms. That is the best way to get information about any future talks that we have. Uh, you can also sign up for our email list either out here on the front table or you can sign up for our email list on the website. Uh, and that will give you uh, more information about the presentations that we have here that are similar to today. Uh, the last Energy and Environment Forum for the semester is going to be April 13th, where we'll have Dr. Andrew Curley, who is a geography professor at the University of Arizona. He's going to be talking about energy and environmental justice issues, uh, I think particularly related to Native American tribes here in the United States. Um, also, on April 27th, uh, we will have another special guest uh, coming here to do a fireside chat. Uh, Mike Boots is the head of Breakthrough Energy Technologies. Uh, he is also a f uh, formerly uh, with the Gates Foundation. Uh, so put that on your calendar as well. That'll be April 27th at 5 p.m. here in the Baker Center. Uh, I want to point out if you are watching us online and you are seen in the room right now, that's great. Hello. Um, but if you do want to see the slides that Ben will be presenting, you should be able to toggle over and see slides instead of just seeing inside of the auditorium. Uh, you'll also see a link at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can use that link to submit questions uh, to Dr. Laird, and then we will uh, field those questions at the end uh, during our question and answer session. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. David Green, our own David Green, fellow here at the Baker Center, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Charles. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Leard, whom uh, we recruited. He's, well, let me say he's a professor in agriculture and uh, agricultural and resource economics, as well as having a joint appointment here at the Baker Center. Uh, we were fortunate to recruit him from Resources for the Future, which many of you may be familiar with, but it's uh, probably, well, certainly a premier, but maybe the premier uh, research institute in Washington, D.C. for analyzing uh, government policies related to the environment. And there, Ben did a lot of uh, well, cutting edge and uh, important research uh, on uh, questions having to do with the environment and, and government policies, but especially focusing on uh, motor vehicles and uh, their greenhouse gas emissions and fuel economy uh, regulatory policies. And uh, so he's really is, as Charles said, an expert in this area. And uh, I'm very much looking forward, and I'm, I'm sure you are, to hearing his talk on a tremendously important subject uh, for the United States and the world today, which is how to decarbonize our transportation sector. Ben? Uh, thanks, Charles, for uh, having me present uh, today and uh, inviting me to this talk. Um, happy to be here. Um, so today I'll be uh, kind of going over a broad uh, discussion. Um, I'm not presenting any particular paper of mine. Um, it's just kind of more of an overview of some of the work that I've done uh, in this area, some other thoughts I've had 
Um, and I really want to, would love to have a discussion about this with you guys. So if there's anything, um, anything that's not clear during my talk, uh, please just raise your hand during, and I'm happy to provide some clarity uh, as we go. And of course, there's a, I think there's a Q&A afterwards as well. Um, so there will be plenty of time for uh, questions. Okay, so uh, this talk is, it's really about uh, climate change. Um, it's about uh, thinking about how we can incorporate transportation in the solution to uh, addressing climate change. Um, in particular, thinking about reducing emissions from our transportation sector. Um, so the motivation here is thinking about uh, climate change being a threat uh, to human welfare. Um, I like this figure a lot. This is a figure from NOAA. Um, I like it a lot because it has kind of different elements of why climate change is a threat. It, there's nothing, there's not one thing. Uh, there's lots of different things. Uh, so we have things like ice caps melting, uh, rising sea levels, more intense uh, storms, hurricanes, um, more wildfires, especially out west, uh, more flooding events, more extreme temp uh, weather, weather patterns, uh, precipitation patterns, uh, hotter temperatures, obviously, and then things like drought. So it's kind of a multitude, and you add those all up, and it gets kind of scary um, once, you, once you look at the entire picture. In terms of uh, our role as human beings, uh, we are playing a role in contributing to climate change. Uh, this is a pretty standard figure that a lot of you have probably seen uh, looking at the relationship between uh, CO2 or carbon uh, dioxide emissions and global temperature. This is data from uh, globalchange.gov um, 100 years ago through about 2010. A little bit, uh, the figure is a little bit outdated now, but it, the trend is basically the same uh, through today. And we see a very gradual uh, increase in CO2 concentration through around the 1950s in a big spike. And we see a similar uh, increase, uh, kind of a parallel increase in global temperature uh, along the way. There's a relationship here that scientists um, have, have documented very, very well that um, you know, more CO2, more uh, global temperature increase. Um, and so uh, this is a problem, as I've said, for all those different things uh, that I mentioned on the first slide. So thinking about, you know, why is this a problem? Uh, why is, uh, you know, what do we do about this? Uh, first of all, why is this a problem? We as economists, I'm an economist, and we like to quantify things. We like to put uh, dollar values on, on social issues. And so a bunch of really smart economists over the last 20 years or so have tried to put a number, a dollar amount, on uh, how much one ton is associated with damage um, in the future to, uh, to human beings, basically. And so this number is now called the social cost of carbon, or SCC for short, and it represents uh, the present value of future damages from emitting one ton of CO2 today, right? So it's a dollar value. Uh, there was a really great uh, paper recently published in Nature uh, that basically updated uh, this value. Um, they found evidence to suggest uh, the SEC is around $185 per ton. That's a super, super important uh, number to remember. Um, of course, there's a range. Uh, with any calculation, there's lots of assumptions that go into that number. Uh, this study finds a range of about $80 to over $300, depending upon kind of what you assume for the discount rate. Um, but their central value is $185 per ton. So I did a simple calculation to say, okay, like, is that a big number? Is that a small number? Currently in the U.S., uh, the U.S. emits around 6.35 billion tons of CO2 per year. And so we can quantify that in terms of economic damages to what we can expect uh, over time. Uh, and that's about $9,300 per household. Uh, so a pretty big number, a uh, pretty scary number, in my opinion, um, from, uh, from, you know, emitting CO2. So with this, uh, with this number in mind, uh, it really motivates uh, 
politically to, you know, to do something about this. And, and so our current administration uh, has a series of climate change goals. So this is a pretty nice figure to summarize those goals. Um, so we have, uh, this figure has metric tons of CO2 uh, and millions on the vertical axis. And then we have uh, time, uh, uh, the years on the horizontal axis. And so we, we've seen uh, over the past 15 or so years, a slight drop in CO2 uh, for our country. Um, it's been going down over time. Um, but uh, as, uh, as we think about kind of current trajectory versus goals, uh, we're expected to go kind of flat unless we can see pretty dramatic uh, changes from a policy standpoint. Um, and so the proposed Biden goal for 2030 would be uh, to get that number down to 3,000 uh, or 3,000 million, which is about 3 billion. Um, and so that would be a 50% drop below 2005 levels. Uh, so a pretty sharp drop. Uh, we would have to kind of uh, get a kink going in that trajectory and to go down. And then the 2050 goal, which is the long run goal for, for CO2 is to get to net zero. So a pretty substantial change in the way we do things um, in our society uh, to get there. Um, but these are the goals that have been uh, laid out by the current uh, administration. All right, so how do we get there? How do we get to this 50% uh, reduction by 2030 and then the zero, uh, net zero by 2050? Well, we can think of this problem in, in kind of sector by sector cases, right? So um, the, left, uh, the left pie chart is the, the latest data that we have from the EPA on greenhouse gas emissions by sector. And so the what stands out here, to me at least, is that transportation is now by far the largest source of emissions at 39%, followed by um, electricity generation at 33%, industrial 16%, and then we have smaller uh, sources of residential and commercial. Uh, but transportation is the leader right now. It's been the leader for the last couple years, and it's really growing in terms of, of, that, of that size of the pie um, we've seen pretty substantial reductions in emissions from electricity, not so much for transportation. We'll talk a lot about why uh, that's been the case uh, today. Um, we can also zoom in on uh, just transportation. So the, the, the right uh, pie chart is just um, transportation sources. And so we can break those out further into different categories. Uh, the talk today I'm gonna focus it mostly on that largest chunk, the green, the passenger cars and trucks, 58% is the largest chunk of that 39% transportation. Um, so these are cars that you and I drive um, to work and such. And then the second uh, component of transportation, uh, that's the largest, com second largest component are these medium and heavy duty trucks these are your tractor trailers, your delivery trucks, uh, fire trucks, school buses, things like that. They represent about 23%. Um, so non-trivial, but not even close to the, the passenger cars and trucks. And then everything else is kind of, you know, 15% or so is whatever or whatever is remaining, which is like aircraft, 9%, uh, you know, flying places. Um, ships and boats are 3%, pipelines 4%, but really the big, the big driver of CO2 uh, emissions uh, from transportation are really uh, vehicles that have wheels. Um, so cars and trucks, and then the big, the big rig uh, tractor trailers. And so today, most of my discussion will be about uh, the passenger car and truck fleet. So that 58%, a lot of what I talk about though, some of the more theoretical ideas you can apply to uh, the medium and heavy duty sector but the data and analysis I'll be talking about is really that, uh, that green uh, slice of the pie there. All right, so we can look at uh, kind of over time, where have we gone uh, with emissions from transportation? Uh, this is another figure from the EPA. Uh, these are greenhouse gas emissions uh, in million metric tons um, from 1990 to basically 2021. 
I've added that in here with the little red arrow. Um, and so back in 1990, we were at about 1.5 uh, billion uh, metric tons. And as of 2021, we're about 1 1.7, 1 1.8, um, so more. Um, and you look over time, it looks pretty flat to me, right? Not a whole lot of change, no dramatic spikes. There are some dips here and there, but overall uh, pretty flat uh, in my opinion. We see the effect of the pandemic at the end there, the uh, 2020, there was a dip, but uh, kind of a reversion since, uh, since 2020, the uh, GHGs have gone back up um, since the pandemic. Uh, although those lockdowns kind of were, uh, they, they went away and so people started to travel a lot more and so we kind of saw this uptick back up to almost pre-pandemic levels. Um, So here's the question, how can we reduce uh, these vehicle emissions? Um, so I like to break things out into very simple equations. Um, and so we can think of emissions as a product of really three factors. Uh, how many cars are in operation? So I call this stock size. So how many cars there are that people are driving uh, daily. Uh, miles traveled per vehicle. So how many miles per year, say, uh, is a typical vehicle driven, and then emissions per mile. Um, and so it's just a product, so we just have a multiplication here. That gives us an estimate of overall annual emissions. We can go further and make it even simpler. We can combine the first two to get total vehicle miles traveled times emissions per mile. So it's really a simple equation. Uh, to reduce emissions, we can reduce one of these or both of them. Um, and so that's the, a way to kind of think about this problem simply. So looking at the first one, we're going to focus on this first one, the total, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to call it VMT. If, if you hear me say that, that, I'm talking about vehicle miles traveled or total vehicle miles traveled. Um, so we're going to look at VMT uh, closer for a little bit. So um, this is a figure from FRED, the Federal Reserve. Uh, they track miles traveled, and so again, all the way back to 1990. Uh, this looks very similar to the CO2 emissions figure. Um, it's not a coincidence. Uh, they look very similar. We see a gradual increase um, of about 1% per year increase in, in VMT. Um, and then there's a couple things that kind of altered that trajectory. Uh, the recession, the Great Recession in 2009, uh, kind of halted that increase, flattened it for a while, but then it kind of went back up to where it was uh, before that recession. And then, of course, the pandemic uh, was a big, uh, big drop, not a huge drop, but a pretty big drop in, in total VMT. But again, as I've said, uh, you know, post uh, lockdown period, uh, VMT has responded almost to uh, pre-pandemic levels. Um, so you can think about, you know, what has caused changes in VMT. Really, there's two factors. Uh, this uh, income, uh, I think some of, the, some of my prior work uh, looks at relating income to VMT. And there was a big drop in income during the last uh, major recession. Uh, and then also lockdowns. Uh, these are kind of the two big factors that have, that have uh, moved the needle on VMT. Um, looking at some of the work that I've done uh, in this area, if you kind of zoom in on any geographic area like Knoxville or DC or San Francisco, uh, wealthier households, households that have more income, they tend to drive more. They have their own vehicles more often, they use them a lot more, and they use less public transit. Um, and so some of the work that I've done, the summary of that work is that as incomes go up, we can expect more uh, VMT across, across the board. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, certainly work from home is going to have, you know, that might be kind of why we're not quite back at like the 2019 levels. Uh, there's, a, there's a gap there. 
I'm not sure exa the exact amount, but um, it's almost back to normal though, and uh, which is kind of surprising to me. You hear a lot of, of this work from home discussion, and, and yet we still see uh, VMT kind of still pretty high. Um, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay, so, uh, you know, we kind of have a sense of what causes changes in VMT, at least historically. Thinking about policy, what, we, what can we do from a policy standpoint? Um, again, this is a, at the top there is the equation for emissions, focusing on the first component. Um, really, it's, it's pretty simple economics from a theoretical standpoint. Uh, we want to make uh, non-private vehicle travel modes, so things like bu taking a bus, uh, train, any kind of public transit or biking, we want to make them a lot more desirable. Um, and we want to make at the same time uh, private vehicle travel less desirable, which is pretty hard uh, to do, um, in my opinion, from a, a politics standpoint. But um, so really, I think making uh, things like public transit a lot more desirable would be, would be one way to do it. Um, things like taxes, uh, so again, as an economist, we like to use taxes a lot, talk about taxes as a way to change behavior. It's probably not a very strong way to do it. It's not very effective. Um, so lots of studies have shown that gasoline taxes, they do change behavior, but it's not very big, right? So typically, uh, literature has found every 10% increase in the gas tax, whether it's at the state or federal, leads to about a 1% to 2% reduction in private VMT. So again, not very big. If you want to, if you want to really move the needle on uh, this, this trajectory, you know, 1% to 2% or even like 10% isn't very much. We want to get 50% or more. You would have to really jack up the price of gasoline to get there. Um, and so uh, from my experience, we, really, we need to see really dramatic changes. Things like free fares uh, would, would be a start. Obviously, that's very difficult uh, in some situations. Uh, from a budget standpoint, but also politically. So uh, it's tough to say exactly what we would do to get there. Um, I want to show you some data that, um, that I pulled together. Uh, I was working on this a while back. Um, and so this is data from the 2017 National Household Travel Survey to really emphasize that people really like to use their own vehicles. Um, and so these are trip mode frequencies. So this, these are all in percentage terms. Um, so 86% of all trips taken in the U.S., uh, this is 2017, um, were by personal vehicle. 8.8% um, was walking, and a very small, these small slivers of like public transit and biking, um, people just really like to use their own vehicles. It's very convenient, very fast, time-saving uh, uh, modes of travel. What about for Tennessee? Similar figure, just larger green area, 90%, uh, 90.5% 90 of uh, people uh, trips are by personal vehicle. So it's even, it's even worse here. Um, walking is less, uh, but the other modes are about the same, give or, give or take a half a percent or so. Um, so I kind of been somewhat throwing my hands up as to how we reduce VMT. Uh, there's not a whole lot of action on the political front to reduce VMT um, for the reason that it's, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to reduce VMT uh, from a policy standpoint. And so going back to this equation of emissions, well, we have at least one other thing we can do. We can reduce emissions per mile, right? And so the idea here is that Given that uh, emissions are a product of these two components, uh, even if VMT kind of continues its trend, if we can get emissions per mile way down, it won't matter, right? Because we're multiplying the two. And this is really why pretty much every, um, you know, most major policies thinking about uh, decarbonization are focused on reducing emissions per mile. And so the rest of my talk will really be focusing on uh, the, the second component. So we've had actually some really good success uh, lately. 
in terms of reducing emissions per mile. So I'm talking about CO2 emissions per mile. So think about uh, driving one mile, how much CO2 is emitted from that, uh, from that uh, driving. Um, and so this is a figure um, that is from some work that David and I have done. I put this together based on a, a data set that we've been working on. And this is uh, the percentage change in CO2 per mile relative to 2002. So everything's relative to 2002 uh, CO2 per mile. And we see uh, really since 2000 in 2008 or so, we've seen a drop, a pretty uh, gradual at, at first, but then very stable linear drop in, uh, excuse me, in emissions per mile. And a lot of this is, it, probably most of this is due to uh, what are called federal fuel economy and greenhouse gas standards for new vehicles. Um, so the government, uh, NHTSA and EPA, they jointly regulate these two features of cars um, and so they are a lot more stringent today, and they've been, they're a lot more stringent, uh, they're becoming a lot more stringent since around 2012. So about, they're 33% more stringent, uh, less CO2 per mile relative to uh, 2012 levels. And so as these new cars enter the fleet um, of the stock of vehicles, we're seeing, uh, you know, a gradual lowering of the overall emissions coming from these vehicles. Um, David's working on uh, helping to tighten uh, the post-2026 standards. So we have standards in place through 2026, and there will be new ones coming out hopefully pretty soon um, for 2027 and beyond. Now, the caveat here, the unfortunate thing about these standards is that they're only for new vehicles. And so I'll talk a lot about this uh, today, thinking about new versus used. And uh, I made a calculation um, the reduction is about 1% per year. If you look at this graph, it's about 1% per year. Um, and so if we think about extrapolating this uh, over time, it'll take a very long time to get to close to zero, you know, well beyond 2050, probably like 2080 or 2090. And you know, we're just not gonna get there with just these standards alone. Uh, not to say that they're, you know, they're not doing their job, they're doing a great job at reducing emissions, um, probably one of the best policies we have right now, but uh, the rate is just kind of slow uh, for getting, you know, fast reductions. So now we turn to thinking about electric vehicles, right? So really, uh, there's a lot of potential for electric vehicles to play a big role here. Um, the idea being that we can combine, um, we can kind of get, you know, combine forces here with electricity and transportation to get uh, more EVs on the road and then increase the grid uh, that produces the electricity going into EVs. And we can get a pretty large reduction in emissions. Uh, you know, 39 plus 33% is a pretty big chunk of the, uh, the emissions pie. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of interest in these vehicles to, to uh, get the job done. And so let's talk more about uh, EVs here. So one thing I'll be um, mentioning a few times in the talk today is uh, I like to call it a bathtub model. Um, it's maybe more of a physics idea, but I think it's very relevant for this issue. Um, so we can think about, uh, we have on the road today, there are about uh, the bath water is, re is represented as the stock of vehicles. So cars that are used and new are the bath water. Uh, we have about 270 million light duty vehicles. These are cars and trucks that we all drive. Um, so not heavy duty. Uh, about 270 million is the used vehicle stock. About 2.5 million are electric vehicles. So that's you know less than 1%, uh, almost 1%, uh, but it, it's pretty small right now. Now what's happening though is that the the rate at which new vehicles, uh, new EVs enter is increasing. And so like the bath water that's being dumped, so like the upper left faucet is like new vehicle sales. <coughs> Excuse me. So that rate's increasing. And so we're getting more and more new vehicles entering the fleet, which is gradually kind of altering the mix of the bath water to, uh, to be more EVs. Um, and then the other end, kind of like the drain, is uh, what I, what, what's called vehicle retirement or scrappage. So the rate at which used vehicles leave the fleet. 
Uh, things like you know, getting into an accident, uh, car gets totaled uh, beyond repair, it'll go to the junkyard and, and it won't be driven anymore. Um, and so we can think of this kind of as a dynamic problem where we have you know, new EVs entering and then altering the composition of this bathwater, this stock, and then hopefully a lot of gas vehicles are leaving, right? And so we, the important thing is the composition of the water, of the stock, not so much the composition of, of the valve of the new vehicles entering. Um, emissions uh, from this sector, emissions per mile, are a function of the stock and not the, uh, the new vehicles that are entering. So kind of keep that in the back of your head as we go here. All right, so um, at the start of my talk, I had the, the title was Challenges and Policy Options. So challenge one, I, there's only two challenges. Uh, challenge one is to increase uh, how quickly new v, uh, EVs are entering the market. Um, so increase the share of new vehicles sold to being EV, increase that fast, right? So the, here's some data. Uh, we have uh, the national sales share on the left, and then we have the California share on the right. So just vehicles sold in California is on the right, and then nationals on the left. We've made pretty good progress recently in both, uh, both California and uh, the overall U.S. Uh, we were at about 2.5% uh, during the pandemic, uh, during 2020, and now it's around 68%. And so it's been going up, uh, not tremendously, but it's been going up um, over time, which is promising. California is its own, it's a whole different uh, uh, state, and they're kind of going up like gangbusters much faster. It's about, it's at 16% or so in 2022. Um, and so, you know, we're getting, we're making progress, but there, it, it, is, it will be a challenge to, to get to 100%, uh, as we'll see here. So why are we seeing these increases in EV sales? Uh, several different reasons. So they're becoming more desirable. Uh, this is a figure from uh, one of my papers where we plotted uh, data through 2019 on uh, some attributes. So we think about, you know, what are, what are people buying EVs? What's well, the attributes of the vehicles? We have to make them desirable uh, to have people want them. And so what we have here we have range uh, that's in blue, average range um, of, of vehicles sold. That's gone up from about 75 miles per, per charge to about 250 miles per charge. So a huge increase in range uh, just in seven, seven or eight years here. Um, tremendous uh, increase in range. And then price per mile of range is just uh, the, the cost of the vehicle divided by the vehicle's range. And that's gone down uh, a lot over time. So vehicles, uh, these vehicles are becoming cheaper over time to buy, and they're becoming better. Uh, the, the range is a big, uh, a big issue when it comes to buying an electric vehicle, and so we're seeing uh, better attributes of the vehicles that are being sold. Another big component of uh, the kind of the sales that we've seen and kind of where, where we expect to go in the future is the number of options available, right? So Right now in the U.S., if you, go, if you go to a dealership, if you go online and you search, you're looking for a new vehicle, you have about 400 different options of makes and models uh, that are gasoline versions, right? So you have about 400 different models, uh, like the Prius, for example, it, uh, would be a model. Um, back in 2012, there were, there were eight models for EVs, right? So eight, very, very few options available very particular style of vehicles were, were available back in 2008, and so therefore there just wasn't a whole lot of variety. So you know we're not going to have very, uh, many sales as a result. Uh, new car buyers are very heterogeneous. They like different things. People are very different. They have different uh, preferences. They have different desires. And so getting, uh, getting the number of options, um, expanding that is going to be very, very useful for boosting sales. And so these are data from a website, um, visualcapitalist.com. And basically through 2021 or so, we've seen a gradual increase. There are about 62 different options as of 2021, and then projected to be a, a double that by 2024, right? So again, 
Uh, not, as, not as many as gasoline yet, uh, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, we're getting there gradually. Um, thinking about uh, the battery and charging and range, um, th these are other data from um, the Alternative Fuel Data Center. Uh, these are public charging station counts both the number of ports as well as the number of station locations. So again, uh, the more charging infrastructure there is, the easier it is to refuel your car, uh, the easier it is to find a refueling station, less hassle. And so these are both growing um, pretty good growth over, over time. And so this will lead to, to more sales. Certainly, yep, exactly. Exactly, yeah, it, it's kind of like uh, one of my um, colleagues would call this like a chicken or egg problem. Um, and, and so, you know, the having more stations will drive demand, which will drive more stations, et cetera, right? So it's almost like a dynamic process that builds on itself. Um, that's exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. We're, yeah. I'll I'll talk about that today. And, and there there are generally these parallel pro uh, policies that'll subsidize both uh, kind of parts of the market. Yep. Exactly. Um, okay. So this is a, this is often an issue that's raised when it comes to thinking about um, electric vehicles and their emissions. So thinking about the greenhouse gas emissions from electric vehicles in particular. So EVs, they use electricity, which is generally from burning fossil fuels from electricity generation. So therefore, the idea is that won't EV adoption increase emissions uh, from electricity generation? The answer is yes. However, if we think about it from uh, just a, kind of an apples to apples, the emissions from a gas car versus the emissions from an EV, EVs are way less uh, emissions intensive right now. Even if you account for all the upstream electricity generation, um, secondly, which is the topic of a paper that David and I have worked on recently, is that uh, the electricity sector is on a path to decarbonization. And so over time, these vehicles become even more clean relative to their gasoline counterparts. Um, and so here's some data on this. Uh, we have data that we've gathered from uh, NREL, a couple different uh, sources from NREL. And uh, these are data of kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour of electricity. Um, and so right now it's about 0.45 as of 2020. Uh, but we're, there's an expectation that we're gonna see serious decarbonization of that sector of electricity emissions, uh, of, of electricity generation. So the, uh, the gray line here is current policy. So this includes uh, things like the Inflation Reduction Act um, and that there is a very, very steep decline of, of this rate uh, of CO2 per generation of electricity, um, you know, from 0.45 all the way down to, to basically 0.1 by 2030. That's like seven years from now. Um, so a huge, huge drop in, in, uh, in CO2 from electricity, which is what goes into the battery. There's other, uh, there's, of course, there's uncertainty here. We don't know exactly how quickly we're going to get there. Um, and so there's kind of a range here of, of different scenarios, but you know, the kind of the, 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 the benchmark middle of the road scenario is a very, very fast uh, reduction uh, from, from electricity generation. And so one of the things that David and I have been working on, this is based on a paper that uh, is under review at, um, at a journal is projecting EV emissions, uh, both uh, the, the emissions of the overall fleet of vehicles on the road, but in particular, looking at EV emissions. Um, if, if we think about pushing EVs into the market, uh, this is a snapshot, this is a figure of one of the scenarios that we've run where we assume that we, we can get to 100% uh, new market share being 100% EVs by 2035 which is California's goal. So very, very fast 
you know, shoving in all these EVs into the, mar um, into the new vehicle market, and then they kind of enter into the stock over time. Um, and so the bottom figure here, or the, the bottom curves here, these dashed lines at the bottom, uh, these represent EV emissions, so CO2 emissions from people driving EVs across different grid scenarios of decarbonization. And so I showed you the last figure, it's these four scenarios for grid decarbonization from electricity sector. These correspond to these four uh, lines on the bottom, the dashed lines. Um, and so what we see relative to overall CO2 um, from light duty vehicles now, EVs are very, very minor in terms of their overall emissions. Um, and so if, if you focus, if you can see the gray line on the bottom there, it's under 5% uh, over time between now and 2050. It's a very, very small amount, right? Um, and so we, we, uh, we attribute this uh, to kind of two things or maybe one thing with two uh, side things or side components. Uh, really, it's a matter of timing. And so I put this figure up here again, this bathwater figure on the left side there. Between now and 2030, even if we ramp up EV sales, their overall amount of, uh, the overall, uh, the stock, the, the amount of cars that are in the stock that are EVs will still be pretty small until 2035 or so. Because again, even if we get 15 million new vehicles that are EVs entering the stock, the stock is 270 million cars, right? So it takes time to have the stock build up over time. And during this early period, really like you know now until 2026 or so, even though there are, there are emissions from electricity generation, uh, there just aren't that many EVs that'll be on the road driven. Um, so again, the line is almost at, you know it, it's very close to zero up through 2030 or 2035 even. And then as there, there's a lot more EVs on the road, we will see some increase in emissions from them uh, but by then, you know, by 2035, 2040, the, the grid is so clean by then, right? The grid under most of these scenarios, by 2040, it's, you know, one quarter or less of the overall emissions uh, relative to uh, 2020 emissions. So it's really kind of a, a, a fortunate timing uh, result here in that, you know, in the short run, not many EVs are being driven. In the long run, there will be a lot of EVs, at least we hope so, uh, but the grid will be a lot cleaner by then. Uh, yeah? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we assumed um, a similar life, uh, lifetimes for EVs relative to gasoline. Uh, we haven't played around with those assumptions. Um, there's really not great data on that. We have data on scrappage uh, that we've been working with to build this model. And uh, there, we only have like eight years of, of like um, eight year old EVs. We don't have like the other part of the curve of like when they're scrapped a lot. And so we just assumed it's going to be the same. We would love to have more data, but you know, time. For sure, that'd be great. Yeah. And I think that's another big thing: is uncertainty with the batteries. So we know that batteries will uh, decline over time; that their capacity will decrease. And um, so, whether the batteries hold up for as long as current cars last. We did a study of that. We found that passenger cars now, half the passenger cars will still be on the road 18 years from now. Uh, half the cars sold today. And for light trucks, even longer, 22, 25 years. So will the EVs last this long? It really depends on how well the battery capacity holds up over time. Sorry, another question over here. Does this model include the embodied emissions? What do you mean? The CO2 emissions during the production of the cars? So the we've left that out um, of, this, of this particular exercise. Um, yeah, it does not include that. 
Um, we also don't include gasoline, or the production of gasoline vehicle emissions. Um, yeah, we just left those out for now. But um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Ben, in, in terms yeah. of uh, really fascinating stuff so far, in terms of uh, hybrid vehicles, how do those mm-hmm. factor into your modeling? Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, so we, um, with this particular scenario of getting to 100% new EVs by 2035, we assume that there will be some increase in hybrid sales over the next five or so years and then a reduction down to zero as other, you know, basically anything that's not an EV goes to zero by 2035. So there will be, we expect there to be some uh, use of hybrid technology for compliance purposes for you know, uh, fuel economy standards. But um, yeah, we do, we do increase that market share over time, but then it goes down to zero. Uh, Certainly, yeah, that's a really great point. Um, all right, so let's talk about some policies of, you know, how can we get to this 100% uh, new EV market share by 2035? So the first one I've already mentioned, um, very stringent fuel economy and greenhouse gas standards. Uh, the current standards go through 2026. They require very significant increases in fuel economy um, over the next couple of years. And uh, NITS and EPA are going to release uh, post-2026 standards uh, pretty soon here. Um, this is going to be the benchmark policy for getting that emissions per mile down across the fleet. Um, and it's going to continue uh, to play a role in the future. Um, another one is uh, thinking about federal tax credits for buying electric vehicles as well as charging station subsidies as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, The credits now, they allow for up to $7,500 for the purchase of a new electric vehicle. Now, these credits have been redesigned. Uh, There used to be a credit um, before the IRA. Um, The new ones with the IRA uh, now have uh, some limits on them, uh, price and income limits, to address some of the issues that were raised of the prior credits. So things like regressivity, the credits were being just bought. Uh, they were being utilized by wealthy households was a, was a concern. And then things that are called non-additional purchases. So uh, the credits were being used by people that would have bought an EV anyway. So it's kind of like a windfall that you're just giving, giving certain households. Um, so these two limits are, are ways to, uh, to address uh, those concerns. And then the third uh, pillar of the policies uh, for increasing new vehicles, new EV uh, sales, uh, are what are called zero emission vehicle mandates or ZEV mandates. Uh, So California, plus about a dozen other states in the US, uh, they require, they they basically are forcing this technology. They require an increasing share of uh, new vehicle sales sold by car companies to be ZEVs. And so the current mandate in California requires 100% uh, new EV market share by 2035. So basically, they're just telling car companies, you have to do this. You're not going to be able to sell any gasoline vehicles in our our state uh, after 2035. Yeah. Do you feel like a lot of the increases in EVs and whatnot or just from a policy perspective have come from these individuals of states pushing for it? Like, do you think that these things in progress would exist without these ZEV states? Um, yeah, I, if you look at the data in terms of EV sales, they are very heavily concentrated in these ZEV states. Now, it, it's hard to disentangle things like preferences that people have versus policies forcing the technology. Uh, you know, California, uh, a lot of people that are pro-environment uh, live there, and so they might be more interested in adopting the, the technology. It's hard to say exactly what's, you know, what's the key driver there. Um, but certainly policy is playing a big role. Um, but it's hard in terms of 
you know, empirically to, to disentangle those two features. It's, it's interesting that a few years ago, uh, you couldn't buy many kinds of electric vehicles in Tennessee because we had no ZEV mandate. And um, now manufacturers have decided that this is really going to happen. And so you can now buy and get these vehicles serviced in Tennessee. Um, but it started in, in California and then to the other ZEV states. And very much, I think, we are getting sort of the spillover benefits from that. Plus, uh, these other policies, like Ben is mentioning, of the, of the tax credits, uh, that's a very substantial amount of money, uh, $7,500. And we have EV manufacturing plants here now, too. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Yep. Okay, yeah, bravo. No supporting policies, but we have plants. We have batteries and we have the money to get on with full zero, I guess. Andrew. No, good, good presentation. I'm always curious about how we compare to European countries, sort of on track with sort of electric vehicle use, as well as um, this sort of environmental policy overall. But then this may be outside the scope of the presentation, but it's also related. I, I kind of like your comments just to get an idea on this, but this is more so Europe uh, than the US on the electricity generation side, the use of say woody biomass as say some type of way to get to a more, uh, less carbon emission and, le and electricity production, whether or not that's a shell game versus an actual reduction. So that's the mm -hmm. second question. But the first is just on ele electric vehicle use in, in our trends. How, we, how do we compare to sort of your typical European country? Uh, that's a great question. I would say um, it depends on which European country. So there are certain countries um, uh, in the EU uh, that are pretty – they're well, well above the U.S. in terms of EV adoption. Uh, that could be driven by policy. It could be a demographic difference. Um, uh, overall, I would say overall the U.S. is lagging behind Europe. Um, not tremendously behind, but they are, we are lagging in terms of EV adoption, uh, just based on some of the numbers. California in particular is probably uh, in the ballpark of a lot of European countries. But the U.S. as a whole is, is, is pretty far behind. Uh, not super far behind, but we're definitely far behind. Um, I'm not as familiar with the biomass question, uh, whether that, that can play a role here. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have a good, a good answer for that one. Question in the back. Yeah, so question about, um, thank you. You're talking about the efficiency standards that they have put into play. And I'm a big believer in boots on the ground research. And I've had multiple mechanics tell me that they get they reach some of that um, by kind of decreasing the weight of certain components of a vehicle, including, mm. well, specifically in my case, um, brake rotors. And they say, you know, now you have to have them replaced every three or so years instead mm. of every 10 years. And so you look at the life of the car and how much of that's going to be offset by having to purchase more and produce more brake rotors and other parts. Is there, in, and it speaks to the question before about how long these vehicles are going to last in mm. terms of the quality of the batteries. So is there legitimacy to that claim that you know of? Mm -hmm. And if so, are there any studies that kind of show that loss in recovering carbon um, mm -hmm. through those efficiencies because they are using lesser <laughs> sturdy materials? It's a little complicated, but it kind of ties in multiple thoughts we've had here. I'm gonna answer it and I'll let David jump in as well. Um, so if, if we look at data on uh, vehicle longevity over time, um, it's actually, vehicles have been, uh, they're lasting longer than they've ever lasted. Um, so the average age, I think, is like 13 now, 13 years old of the fleet. And it used to be 10 years ago, it was like 11. And so the average age has been going up. Um, um, but yeah, David, do you have anything else to add? They really last longer. They're lasting longer, yeah. I, I think a better, my, my view, a better way to measure the uh, life of vehicles is, is the expected lifetime. In other words, how many years um, until half of the vehicles are scrapped and half are still on the road? And we measured that in a study which you can find on the Baker Center website, documenting a very clear trend of increasing longevity uh, of uh, since 2002, 
maybe three to four years for passenger cars increasing, but more like five to eight years for light trucks increasing. And this is partly due to the cost of the vehicles and the, and the content. There's a lot more content in a vehicle now than there used to be, and the vehicle's purchase price are higher, but also due to improved uh, manufacturing and other techniques that, uh, you know, cars used to rust out. Car you hardly see cars rusting out anymore. Uh, uh, and the engines last longer there, but I, I, I could go on and on about it. But I want to get back to your point about electric vehicles and brakes. Um, electric vehicles use their brakes a whole lot less than internal combustion engine vehicles because a key aspect of an electric vehicle is something called regenerative braking, which uses the electric motor backwards as, an, as a generator to produce electricity and put it back in the battery. So a lot of the braking of an electric vehicle is done by uh, regenerative braking rather than uh, using uh, disc brakes. Uh, the other thing is that electric vehicles weigh more. And so they actually have to have more powerful brakes <laughs> than internal combustion engine vehicles. Yes, it's a good idea to uh, take mass out of electric vehicles. It's a good idea to take mass out of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles for fuel economy. Of course, it has to be well, well designed and well thought through to maintain the safety of the vehicle, but but I, I don't think that's I don't think that's uh, a problem with electric vehicles. Um, from what we know, as the gentleman said, their maintenance costs are substantially lower, and less maintenance is required. Mechanics may not like that, um, and uh, and we expect that they will last longer, but we don't know that because we do know the battery's capacity declines very gradually over time. And, and how that will work out after 15, 20 years, we're not so sure. Sorry. Thanks, David. Um, all right, so um, are current policies enough? Uh, this is a huge question, uh, really hard to answer. I'm just going to kind of go over some caveats with the policies and then talk about uh, what's next in the talk. Um, so uh, fuel economy standards are great. Uh, but they don't actually require an increase in EV sales. Um, it kind of gives companies flexibility. Uh, the, the, the IRA tax credits, uh, they have these new restrictions, which in my opinion will be uh, detrimental to increasing uh, EV sales. We'll see how much of an impact those restrictions have. Uh, time will tell. And then finally, the, the ZEV mandates that we have at the state level, there's no federal ZEV mandate, right? So you could think of there might be a situation where you have kind of a segmented market where you have ZEV states selling a lot of uh, ZEVs and then non-ZEV states selling a lot of gasoline vehicles still. There's no, there's no coordination there. Uh, and then finally, uh, the next part of the talk, uh, challenge number two is that none of the policies address uh, having people give up their used gasoline vehicles. Um, so there's something called the Gruenspect effect. Uh, it's based on a paper uh, by Howard Gruenspect. Basically, if you have a policy like a ZEV mandate or fuel economy standards, uh, what these do is that they reduce, in particular for EVs, uh, like a ZEV mandate, they're going to reduce the, the availability of used gas vehicles. There will be fewer of them on the road. That's the point. However, people that prefer gas vehicles, they're gonna bid up uh, the prices of, of remaining gas vehicles um, because there are fewer of them. So supply and demand uh, in operation here. And as used gas vehicles become more valuable, they're gonna last longer. People are more likely to repair them um, as, they, as they're more valuable. And so this could delay uh, this, this stock turnover uh, that we'd like to see happen. So challenge number two, getting rid of uh, gas vehicles from the road. These are data from uh, the National Household Travel Survey. Um, it's somewhat older data um, relative to uh, uh, today, but uh, these are the vehicles in operation by fuel type. Gas and diesel are the blue, uh, and so it's almost all gasoline and diesel across the entire age distribution. So we have this stock problem to address how do we get these used gas cars off the road? Um, another thing uh, to think about is uh, the stock of vehicles has gone up over time. There are more vehicles in operation now. 
Uh, back in 2002, there were about 220 million vehicles. Now it's about 270. Um, and so what this implies is that it'll take longer. If we have about 15 million new vehicle sales every year, it takes longer to replace all the vehicles the larger your fleet size, right? So the, the right axis here is the ratio of stock size to new vehicle sales. It was about 14 and a half back in 2002, and now it's about 18. So it, it'll take more years now to, to get the existing stock off the road. So what are some policy options? Really, there's not a whole lot of policy options here for, for thinking about removing gas vehicles from the fleet. We had cash for clunkers back in 2009. Uh, that was mostly a stimulus plan, but it did kind of have an environmental uh, component. California has its own policy where it, it pays people up to $9,500 uh, to, to buy an EV, but they also have to scrap one of their old gas cars. And then uh, the, as far as I can, uh, that I'm familiar with, the only proposal that I've seen at the federal level, it's called uh, the, the Clean Cars for America plan by Senator Chuck Schumer back in 2019. It would operate similar to California's program um, and that it would give people a new, uh, it would give people a voucher, kind of like a, a rebate to buy an EV, but to get the voucher, you'd have to scrap an old gasoline vehicle. Um, it was a proposal, there's no law for that right now. Um, there's no force to, to get this uh, into law, at least right now, but it was a proposal at the time. So what are some concerns? There's, there's kind of a lot of concerns with these scrappage programs to, to remove the, the gas vehicles. One big one, additionality. Um, so people thinking about subsidizing people to give up their gas cars. Uh, some people would have given up their cars anyway. They would, they would have uh, sent their car to the junkyard anyway. And if they get this subsidy, they're just getting a windfall. So it's kind of an inefficient uh, way of spending money. Another one, a paper that I've worked on, is uh, thinking about opportunity costs. And so the effect of any subsidy to scrap a car is diminished uh, due to the fact that there's competition with uh, the trade-in decision. So if I'm a car owner um, and my car is worth more than the subsidy, if I go to, uh, to a dealership to trade it in, I'm not going to take the subsidy. I'm just going to go to the dealership and trade in my car. And so there's this competition effect uh, that can really diminish the impact and then finally, thinking about um, interacting markets, uh, these policies have potentially not so great interactions with the used car market. And so what they do is that they effectively reduce the supply of used vehicles. And this will, again, supply and demand in operation here, uh, this will raise the price of existing gas, uh, gas vehicles, which will slow down the rate that other uh, gas vehicles are uh, scrapped from the fleet. So. Uh, generally, these three uh, make it make it pretty hard of a sell uh, to get these the, uh, these policies in place in operation. All right, so the last couple slides here, I wanted uh, to talk about carbon pricing, uh, thinking about a carbon tax. It's not on uh, the agenda right now politically, but uh, it is a very strong force. It's a really great policy for lots of different reasons to address uh, decarbonizing transportation. Again, we have the, uh, the bathtub model diagram here. And the reason I put it up again is that a carbon tax, it operates along many different margins. Um, it can reduce emissions uh, along both the, uh, the incoming stock margins. So a carbon tax would make uh, EV sales go up because gas vehicles would be relatively more expensive to operate. And so we would see more EV sales from the, the new car side. It would also uh, accelerate the rate of scrappage on the other end, uh, again, by making gas vehicles more uh, expensive to operate. They will be less likely to remain in operation over time. Um, and then the final thing, thinking about uh, VMT, all the discussion we had about VMT today, uh, carbon tax would raise the, the price of gasoline, um, and so that would reduce... Uh, driving. Not a whole lot, but it would reduce the amount of driving done. So, uh, you know, would carbon pricing really mess up the economy? We can look at different, uh, different countries or uh, different states like California to get some evidence on this. And uh, this is a figure from California Air Resources Board. 
which basically shows they've had, California has had a cap and trade program since 2012 that prices carbon emissions from their state. Um, and so we see here uh, GDP, uh, everything here is relative to, uh, I think the year 2001 or 2000. And we see uh, greenhouse gas emissions going down, GDP is going up. So not a whole lot, uh, there's not a whole lot of impact. Obviously this isn't a causal relationship, but um, I think it's pretty striking to see that you can get, uh, you can have an effective greenhouse gas uh, carbon pricing program uh, while not reducing GDP uh, really it, almost at all. And finally, thinking about a, a big issue with uh, pricing carbon that is raised is, is it equitable? Um, what, how, will, how would pricing carbon, something like a carbon tax affect low-income households? It really depends on how, what you do with the revenue. Uh, this is a, a study from uh, the U.S. Treasury looking at, <coughs> excuse me, they ran a model where they looked at if we had a $49 per ton carbon tax uh, across uh, the U.S., and then we took the revenue from that carbon tax and gave it back to people as, as basically checks. Uh, so the amount here is $583 per person. So every person would get just a check every single year of that amount. And the overall, uh, the overall distribution of uh, costs and benefits, uh, most of the low, lower income uh, deciles here actually benefit from this policy. Um, so one through seven would benefit, and then uh, eight, nine, and 10 uh, in terms of income deciles. So more uh, wealthier households are eight, nine, and 10. Uh, they would lose, but then uh, the one through seven would actually, um, it would be a net gain. And so it really depends on how you design uh, what you do with that revenue. You can make it as progressive as you want it to, or like to make it um, to address this equity issue. Um, yes. I have two questions. The first one is about the price of, uh, like, about the carbon tax. You said it would be effective, but at the beginning of the presentation, you said that uh, an increase in the price of the gasoline didn't have a very significant impact. So why is the difference? So yeah, the the bottom that really has to do with the bottom part. So in terms of moving uh, how much people travel, a carbon tax probably won't have a whole big impact on how much people travel. Mm -hmm. But it will. It could potentially have a pretty big impact if we add all up, if we add up all three of these components here. So, what types of vehicles are being bought, what vehicles are being scrapped, and then how much they're all being driven, right? Even if the the VMT isn't moving a whole lot, if we add them up, up together, we could get a pretty big uh, result with uh, with the carbon tax. Um, my other question was about the uh, GHG and the uh, the emissions overall. Uh, did the graph uh, and like uh, included also the um, outsourcing because it's like a, a wealthier country could easily have its, its industry in another country and say okay we're not polluting but it's kind of hidden is it this figure talking about the California yeah. yeah I mean so I think you're referring to like leakage you know emissions leakage so you could have more emissions yeah. elsewhere um, I'm not as familiar with that literature um, generally leakage you can address it in different ways. You can do something called a carbon border adjustment uh, to address leakage concerns. Um, but is it on the graph, like are, are the DHD uh, including these leakages? Or I think this particular graph is just California emissions. It's not accounting for potentially other, other leakage effects, but yeah. Thanks. Um, and uh, that is it for my slides. Uh, look forward to any questions that you have. So I guess, yeah. Ben, you, most of this is really sort of demand side policies. Mm. Um, you, you never really talked about capacity in production in the U.S. as much. Um, in terms of the potential for increased production and how easy mm. is it to sort of retrofit or even change production and manufacturing facilities to go from sort of the production of gasoline vehicles to mm -hmm. electric vehicles? Clearly, if you think about supply being relatively fixed in the short run, mm. it almost seems like these policies would make electric vehicles more expensive, mm -hmm. while at the same time making gasoline vehicles relatively cheap if supply can't in any way 
sort of keep up with the demand that's driven by the policy. Am I seeing that wrong? Oh, no, that's a great point. Um, yeah, generally vehicle redesigns, you know, there, there is a, a good amount of time that's required to redesign the vehicle. Now, one thing that I've recognized car companies do is to, they basically have um, either, it might be more of a marketing ploy, but they basically been building electric vehicle versions of gasoline vehicles. So a, a big, a, you know, a good example of that is the Ford F-150 Lightning. Um, they probably use a lot of the same manufacturing to do that. Obviously the battery is, is a lot different from the engine. Um, but in terms of transitioning away, I think a lot of companies are kind of taking existing platforms and then just saying, okay, let's put a battery in that car instead of uh, the engine. They don't have to you know, redesign the entire uh, vehicle to make it, you know, EVs look very similar to a typical gasoline vehicle. So from a structural design, um, it, it's not a whole lot of work, but um, yeah, anyway. Um, you said that Americans prefer using their personal vehicles for travel across the United States. And um, Biden announced an expansion of Amtrak across the United States. So I was wondering if we could see rail as a viable alternative and continual investments in rail over the next 20 years. Yeah, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, big fan of rail. Uh, personally, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a challenge uh, for the U.S. given how uh, spread out the U.S. is. Uh, I think that's what makes it kind of hard to economically uh, to make it uh, competitive, say with the private, uh, private ownership you know, of, of a vehicle. Um, yeah, like if you look at the price of travel, for example, of, of uh, driving your own car versus taking uh, like a train, for example, it's not that great. Like it, you're not saving that much money if you take, take rail and you certainly aren't saving time. Uh, taking, you know, taking a train, Amtrak, for example, uh, generally takes longer uh, to, uh, you know, to go from A to B. Um, and so these two are huge inputs into what makes people decide, do I take my own car? Do I rent a car? Do I take, you know, a bus or rail? Um, it's a really hard problem given the, the, uh, the geography of the U.S., in my opinion. Um, but it's certainly, you know, it, it's worth looking into more. Then we got several, several questions from the gallery online, but a group of them kind of all were centering around the same idea, which was you talk a lot about economic incentives today um, on, on the demand side. Are there similar efforts that you know of or similar research around sort of the behavioral nudge idea that, that mm. we can, there are policies that we could set up that would potentially nudge people who might be on the border of adopting an electric vehicle? Yeah, there's not a whole lot of research. Um, I haven't done any research on that, um, but in terms of my view of the literature, there's not a whole lot of academic papers looking at that question of like, okay, suppose we you know, change, there, there's some work on like labeling, you know, like fuel economy labeling, that's more, that's more of just like gasoline fuel economy choice. Um, there's not a whole lot to, that, that people have said about, uh, you know, nudging people into EVs. It's a really great point uh, if I think about it more, but um, I'm just not familiar with uh, what the, you know, what will we do about that? Um, I'll have to think about that more. To follow on on that, yeah, um, I was thinking about a carrot and stick sort of a, an approach where uh, you could look at that fuel economy label on the internal combustion engine vehicle and then put in a, um, a purchase tax mm -hmm. based on that, mm -hmm. use that to uh, supply the carrot side to help offset the cost of EVs for less fortunate. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, I mean, taxes, in my opinion, are they're pretty effective uh, for people. They're also very politically difficult uh, to, to, you know, to, to move uh, through the system. Um, uh, having a tax explicitly on on gasoline vehicles, um, in, it would, it would, I think, it would do a lot of good. Um, uh, there's all that reminds me of a related issue of you know should we tax uh, registrations uh, of electric vehicles as a way to raise revenue for highways, and so um, you know effectively the um, 
highway infrastructure is funded from gasoline tax revenue and EVs don't, they don't buy gasoline. So how do we, you know, there's like this fairness issue. Um, it's, it's not an obvious answer as to whether we should in fact have EV owners pay this registration tax to account for that gap. Um, you know, on the one hand, we really want that, you know, we want more EVs on the road, but they're not paying this infrastructure uh, thing. So uh, it, it's kind of hard to say, you know, which one is better. Sounds like a nice subsidy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Lauren. Hey, yeah, sorry to ask another public transportation question, but I guess I'm just curious because, you know, in the very beginning, you kind of talked about the reason the focus is on um, electric vehicles rather than, it's just because you'd have to, the cultural difficulties of making public transit more desirable, like, we'd almost have to have this infrastructure to have to work very well for a long time and then people would want to participate in it more. Do you feel like the uphill battle of getting public transportation better in this country is more or less difficult around the same as doing EV turnover, uh, just from a policy standpoint? Interesting, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think EV adoption will be easier. Okay. Um, that's, a, that's a very complex question uh, you know, very complex question with a pretty simple answer, but um, yeah, I, you know, EVs, they're, they're very similar to gasoline vehicles in a lot of ways. Uh, not, there's lots of differences, but fundamentally, you know, they, they're similar size, they drive pretty similarly. Um, refueling's obviously different, but uh, there's also a lot of uh, attributes of electric vehicles that are better than gasoline vehicles, right? So, uh, you know, there's no exhaust. Um, you feel better about the environment when you drive an electric vehicle. Um, it's cheaper to, to drive an electric vehicle. The per mile, ga the, the fuel cost is cheaper, right? So there are things that EVs are already better than gasoline vehicles, whereas thinking about public transit uh, options, you know, taking the bus or a train versus uh, driving your own car, there's not a whole lot of attributes that make like taking a bus better than uh, uh, like driving your own car. It's, you have to, you know, like I said in, in the presentation, you'd have to like make them free even, you know, the fares be free. Um, the cost, like something about the economics has to change in my opinion to make, to make people go into buses a lot more. Um, cars along most of the relevant dimensions are just much better than like taking the bus for most people. Um, for now, that's how it is now, and you know things can change, but uh, th that's how things are right now. Yeah. Where did the transition to all hybrid vehicles go? Like, I feel like there's this false dichotomy of only ICs or only all electrics. Was there no? Do we not have time to use full hybrid fleets as a stepping stone? Because it seems. It, it is, I mean, hybrid is both of them. Yeah, so I don't I know agree. where that got lost. Um, I have a couple thoughts on that. So the first one is, I think there, there, if you look at data on hybrid sales, they are actually going up over time. In the last year, they, they went up pretty dramatically. Um, I think car companies as a way to comply with these more stringent uh, fuel economy standards will adopt more hybrids as kind of a, like not only like a hedge, but also just like, okay, we can't just you know, increase EV sales tomorrow, so we can, though, design hybrids rather fast, and so let's get some more of those sales in maybe in like the next five years or so. Um, so I definitely see hybrids playing a role in like the short to medium run, you know, five year, maybe 10 year period, um, and then a full transition to electric vehicles. Um, the other thing, thinking about, uh, this reminds me of uh, the economics of a plug-in hybrid vehicle. So that's different from a hybrid in that um, it's like a hybrid vehicle. It's a lot more fuel efficient uh, than a gasoline vehicle, but it also, so it can, it, it, uh, it has a gasoline engine, but it also has an, a battery. Which it can run just on the battery, right? Um, so it's like, well, that's kind of like even more of like in between, right? You have both, which is great. Uh, the, the downside to, to plug-in hybrid vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles is that 
um, they cost a lot to produce. You have to have both the engine, the, the typical ICE engine, uh, the gas engine, and you have to have a battery, right? So you're adding this cost on, whereas you know, a, battery electric, uh, a battery electric vehicle just has a battery. There's no gas engine. You know, gasoline car just has gasoline. And so in terms of the manufacturing cost, it's a lot more costly to produce this kind of hybrid thing that has both. Um, and so, you know, again, people are very sensitive to price when they buy a car. And so would people be willing to pay an extra five to $10,000 to have both of these things in there? A lot of people probably wouldn't, right? They're just gonna go with the gasoline or just the, uh, the battery electric vehicle. Um, Could I comment so yeah, on that too? Yeah. I, I, th I think that's a really good uh, point that you're making because uh, a hybrid vehicle will use about one third less gasoline than a, a standard internal combustion engine vehicle. The cost of a hybrid vehicle today is such that it will pay for itself in fuel savings in three to six years, which is pretty good. Uh, so it's, it's economical. Um, if you talk to manufacturers, a lot of them will say, it's enough of a headache for me to try to transition to battery electric vehicles really fast and I don't wanna have to worry about anything else. <laughs> uh, but the hybrid technology is well known, it's proven. Uh, and uh, if you said you wanna to get to zero on, on Ben's graphs, you're still not at zero in 2050 even though you've gotten to 100% electric vehicles and you've got a very clean grid. And it's because of the legacy internal combustion engine vehicles. And how to get that uh, down to zero, you could get a third of that way if you just made sure that everything else was a hybrid over that same mm -hmm. period of time. And then you still got some work to do. Can you accelerate the scrappage? Can you put some, uh, you know, synthetic fuels in there that have no uh, net carbon emissions? What, what Can you transition to alternative modes? What else can you do to get the rest of the way is a really hard problem. And because for the rest of the transportation system, it's, it's probably tougher than for the light duty vehicles. This is actually quite important, I think. So before we wrap up, I, I wanted to thank the Sustainability Research uh, Network at the Haslam College of Business for helping us co-host today. And I want to turn it over to my Haslam colleague for a quick announcement. <laughs> thank you very much for this kind invitation. And my name is Niraj Bardwaj. I'm from the Sustainability Research Network over at the Haslam College of Business. And what we're interested in doing is we don't think that purpose and profit are enemies. And what we're really interested in doing is really building the business case for what happens with regards to initiatives that are dedicated to the environment as well as social initiatives. And so if you're interested in any of our talks, by all means, please attend. And if you want to just go ahead and check out that QR code, you can connect to me and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Just as a quick case in point, we had Emily Garbinski, who actually we live streamed from Cornell. And she was actually talking about this notion of financial well-being and how financial well-being leads to psychological well-being, which in turn is linked to societal well-being. So those are the kind of things that we like to talk about. And one question, or actually a response to your question about the behavioral research that might be able to answer some of this, there's a, a really neat framework by Kate White, who's at UBC, who's talking about the SHIFT framework, S-H-I-F-T, and how do we go ahead and, and indoctrinate folks and get them to sort of make these behavioral changes and they focus in on habits and they start off with the intention action gap. But nonetheless, we're, we're so happy to be here and be able to partner with the Energy and Environment Forum because we clearly believe that it takes a lot of different disciplines working together in order to solve some of the wicked problems that we're facing today. And you know, at the Haslam College, we've got faculty from each and every one of the departments as well as doctoral students. And so thank you to the Energy and Environment Forum. And of course, I wanna give a big thank you on behalf of the SRN to Ben Leard for going ahead and sharing his research and on the need to really, really promote EV uh, adoption. And in your honor, we've gone ahead and uh, planted 50 trees right. here in Appalachia, okay? So thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, everyone. And Ben, thank you for putting in the marathon presentation today. Everybody join me one more time in thanking our speaker for today.